My guest today is Craig Shoemaker. Craig, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, thanks for coming. I've been listening to you on virtually for many years, back when you did your polymorphic podcast. Right, uh, yeah. Uh, decades ago. <laughs> and uh, and, <laughs> so um, and I, I, I finally got to meet you. That's, this, is, this is exciting for me. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I've seen your, your name uh, around the circle uh, for a long time. So it, it, I think one time I was looking at my Twitter followers and you're one uh, among the earliest of, of people that I've been following and, and interacting with on Twitter. So that's, uh, that's oh, really I'm flattered cool. to hear that. I'm going to tell people you yeah. said that. <laughs> uh, now, now, what are you doing now? Uh, what I'm doing now, I'm uh, working a lot on like just thinking about building courses and what it takes to kind of get expertise, knowledge, and reproduce that among other people in, in a way that you can package up and, and kind of, you know, do online and, and, and hopefully sell and make some money in the process. Okay. And you're actually doing that. You've been doing that for a while. You're a plural site author. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I started that journey probably about 15 years ago as well. Wow. Um, and right now I have about 15 active, uh, courses in the plural site, uh, catalog. Um, a few of them might need to be updated at this point, but uh, the, the the main ones that uh, that that get the most views are, are obviously um, get the most attention and, and have been updated a lot. And it's just been it's been a really fun process of of learning how to take concepts that you you want to be able to express to someone in a disconnected fashion and be able to to help them understand and help them you know learn to code, build websites maybe build a business out of it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just really fun learning how to do that. Yeah. You know, I, I do a lot of uh, online education, but it's more in like real small packets and I'll create a video. Here's how you do uh, sure. uh, uh, application insights in Azure. Um, right. <laughs> but not a, it's not a full course. Uh, building a course is a lot more involved in that. Uh, if, if I'm thinking about actually creating courseware, what, what's the, what are some of the things I need to consider? Well, the, the first thing you need to do is Start with something that you've done in the past, right? So pick, picking a problem that has been uh, affected your life and you've been able to come up with a solution for it that you kind of think, okay, well, maybe this is, is something that other people might feel that pain of. And so I know some people are like, they get really excited about building courses and, and they, they see the opportunities are available and they're like, well, I'm going to pick something, I'm going to learn it and I'm going to build a course, but that's generally not the best way to go about it. So basically starting with your competence, starting with a, you know, a significant problem that you've been able to solve in your own life. If you sort of start that as your square one and then look around and see, well, who else has this same pain? Who else? needs to have a solution uh, to, to this exact same problem, then you have an opportunity to go and talk to people and kind of validate your ideas to see if this is something that's worthwhile pursuing. So I have an idea and I've, I, it's something that I have expertise in. I've just gauged that there is interest in this and now I'm ready to actually start building the course. What's step one? Right. Okay. So yeah. So step one, I would say you're ready with an idea, but you may not be ready to start building the course yet. So the biggest thing that you want to be able to do is to make sure that you have validation that your idea is something that really resonates with a lot of people before, like I said, you, you make those big steps of investing a lot of time into it. So the first thing I do is I, I take your idea and then and go and just essentially do market research. So you want to look at like Reddit or you want to look at Facebook groups or you want to look at technology groups. You, you want to get an idea of are people asking these questions? Is this, is this a widespread problem that needs to be solved? And as you're doing that, you get an opportunity to hopefully make connections and find people either within your network, within social media or within some of those, those groups that you're, you're, you're working with. And then you can make connections and you can uh, ask these people, you know, I've solved this problem in the past. You know, can, can you give me an hour of your time so that I can kind of lay out uh, how I've done it? And during this process, what you want to do is you want to get as much feedback from them as the solutions that you're providing in that context. Because the whole idea is, is you want to keep things very light, very uh, low fidelity, so that you can essentially get that feedback to find if what you're building is something that eventually people are going to want to spend their time and money in using. 
And so once you get that feedback, then you ruthlessly apply it to your content. This sounds very agile, out. by the way. This is, <laughs> right? What you're describing is exactly like agile software development. Get and, fast and feedback. Process. And if you've made a bad assumption, find out early before you've invested time in recording. Exactly. Or software. It, it's, it's fine. You know, I've never really put it in those terms, but I think that's, that's a brilliant way to, to, to describe it. Um, and so if you getting that feedback is as fast as possible, like you're saying, before you've just kind of built all this stuff that's, that's hard to redo, right? Um, and, and so then once you have that feedback, then what you can do, two things will happen. You'll either get validation of your idea and you'll get good feedback, which is great. But if you get neg negative feedback, that's probably even better because then you have an opportunity to say, okay, well, maybe I'm not solving the problem the right way or maybe I need to solve a different problem, and then you can kind of go from there. And so once you go through that process, then it gives you an opportunity to then kind of build the beta of your course and, and have a direction of, of where you're headed. Um, but that feedback is key. What do you mean by beta of your course? So, uh, so that, I, I call that process working with your pioneers, right? So you have a small group of people, you have three to five people that you've bounced ideas off, You've given them the, you know, different ways that you could solve the problem or at least communicate solving the problem and you sort of get, uh, you get that response of whether or not that works for them. So then before you even want to take the next step of building a full course out is if you launch a beta and, and this is kind of a, a pre-sell um, uh, process that you can go through. So you announce to your network, if you have an email list, if you have social media following, whatever you have available to you and you say, hey, I'm going to be teaching this course in, in a live format for three weeks, four weeks, you know, six, wh whatever it takes. Um, and I'm going to offer it at a discount price. And the whole idea is that you're going to help me build and shape this course along the way. Um, then you have an opportunity to launch a beta version of your course. And the key thing is, is you, you, you're pre-selling before you're building the full, you know, production fidelity version of your course. And as people sign up for that, it's again, th so before with your pioneers, what you were finding out is, does this idea that I have solve a real problem that's in need, right? W if you pre-sell your course, then you're answering the question, do I have product market fit? Are people willing to pay for this course? Mm -hmm. And since you do it in a live format, you get even more feedback from a wider uh, se uh, a set of people, then you have the biggest questions answered that you need to know do people want it? Will they pay for it? And then you can go build out your course and then publish it through whatever means possible. Okay. And uh, to be clear, I think we're talking mostly about uh, online courses. Um, Correct. Maybe recording, like, like you're doing with Pluralsight. Um, yeah. Uh, so so is that, uh, what are we showing them when, we, when we're talking about a beta? Are we actually showing some recordings of this or are we just presenting ideas to a large audience? You can. I mean, I, the, kind of the best way to look at it is just keeping it as simple as, you know, you put in some slides. Okay. Um, maybe uh, some people have done this with just a Google Doc or an outline. Okay. And, and the idea is th the value that people get at that beta stage is they get the opportunity to interface with you one-on-one. -on -one. Because once you've created a, a recorded course and it's on demand, then it's, it's packaged, right? And it's produced and it, it sort of is what it is. It's really of course hard you can to always go back and edit a video to change one mistake <laughs> you made. It really is. I've... I've spent time producing uh, um, parts of my clips and I've realized like I have something on the screen, maybe it's the clock or a login or something that I don't want to show. And like I've gone frame by frame because I'm moving stuff around in order oh, to take yeah. that out. And yeah, yeah it, that's not fun. Um, so yeah, it, it just, just comes down to um, keeping it uh, very low fidelity and, and easy to change in the beginning people get that proximity to you, they get that opportunity to ask you questions and, and, and get the feedback during the, the beta phase. Um, and then at that point, you, you should have a really good idea of, of what the full thing should look like and then you can go and create it with confidence that people are gonna, are gonna want it. Awesome, this again, this sounds really much like Agile and like lean software development as well. Right. Don't invest, yeah. you know, don't put the building up. <laughs> Once you put it up, it's hard to change it. You know? It is, uh, yeah. But uh, so avoid this big design up front. Be, be flexible right. and change it. All right. So now I've got it. I've, now I'm convinced. Uh, whatever mistakes or uh, bad assumptions I made originally, I've corrected them because I got that feedback, and I'm ready to start actually producing something. What's how yeah? Does that go? Uh, so at that point, then what you're doing is uh, 
Well, you, you have a lot of clarity at that point, right? So then you can kind of go through and, and, and build out your modules. And th there's so many different ways to deliver a course. You, know, you could do it as, a, as an email course where people get lessons once a day or, or you know, whatever cadence you want. You could do it as a screen share or screen recording type of course, like what you often see in Pluralsight. You could do something to where you know, there's heads up camera uh, recordings with graphics. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can produce and, and deliver your course. Um, and so at that point, what you're doing is kind of figuring out, well, what's the best form factor that I need to, to employ? And what's the best way to, to kind of explain and get my point across? Um, so like if you're doing a programming course, chances are you're going to be doing a screen recording. You're going to open up the IDE. You're going to show people how to use APIs. You're going to do all that kind of stuff. If you did something that was more, say, marketing or, or relationship-based, you know, might be more uh, on-camera type of thing. So it just kind of depends on, on what the needs are for your, your content. Okay. So I've recorded it. I've released it either through email or through uh, some uh, YouTube, whatever. Um, now I want people to watch it. Yes. That's a big <laughs> challenge. How, how do you address that? So th there is a whole art and science to, to a launch of a course. And one of the biggest problems people make, especially if you're doing it independently, like not through a publisher like Pluralsight or Skillshare or LinkedIn Learning, something like that, is they'll, they'll just say, hey, I've got a course available. I hope you check it out. And they'll put a link in their, the bio of their social or on their website or something like that and, and kind of go from oh, there. For the best. But, <laughs> right. Well, it's, I mean, it's but awesome if you have a, a gazillion followers, but not a lot of us do. It, 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 well, so that, that's, that can be a false positive too. Because there's a lot of people, it, it depends on, on your, your message and, and who's following you for what, mm -hmm. right? So for the last, say, 15 years or whatever, I've had a Twitter account. I mostly talked about programming stuff. And I built up a, a following through that, not without really trying to gain a following, but just because of the different things I was involved in over mm -hmm. the years. Um, then I recently repositioned things where so I wanted to talk about courses and help people building courses. And a lot of people unfollowed me, which is, is fine, okay. right? Because you, you only want people kind of in your, in your circle and in your network who are interested in, in the thing that you're interested in talking about, right? Okay. So sometimes it helps to have a large social media following as long as, as your message and your positioning is congruent with your offer. Okay. Um, and so th that can be a nuanced thing if you're you know, changing directions or if people have grown an account based off of like, you know, silly memes or, <laughs> yeah. you know, stuff like that. But it does certainly help. But even, even if you have a, a following people who are really locked in your message and, and really, you know, are interested in the things that you were doing, even with social media, it's like I, I could put something up and only a fraction of my following is even going to see it anyways. Mm. So you need to think in terms of there's, there's a system there's a process and you can almost consider it a, a campaign towards launching a course to where you want to warm your audience up. You want to build a wait list. You want to give them an idea of what's coming and you want to keep providing value along the way so that once it gets to that point to where it's, you know, you open up the cart and it's like ready to, for, for people to start buying, yeah. you know, they're in a position to where they, they feel confident that whatever success you've been able to, to do yourself, you can replicate in them as well. Okay, that's good advice. I, uh, can you tell me, give us an idea of what actually goes into a good course? What's, uh, uh, what are the things that you've learned over the years? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest kind of epiphanies that I had was um, one day I was uh, invited to go and speak at my, my kids' uh, class in elementary, fourth or fifth grade or something. This is like, like the what, what do you do for a living day? What do you do for a living day? <laughs> you know, they're like, you, you podcast, you do like software stuff, come in and, and talk to the kids. I'm like, cool, it'll be fun. But I had to, I had to figure out, because I, I decided I was going to talk about programming, and I had to figure out, well, how am I going to take these concepts and make it relatable and honestly, exciting um, and, you know, somewhat interesting to a, a room full of like, you know, 10 and 11 year olds. And so one of the first things that I, I wanted to teach them was, was like some of the fundamentals of programming. So I was thought strings. Okay, well, how can I express what a string is to, you know, this, this classroom full of kids? And so I went to the store and I bought one of those happy birthday signs, you know, they have, they're all strung together letter yep. by letter and hang it up on the wall. 
And, and so I, I brought that to class. And first I started with a kite string and I talked about, you know, kind of how that works and all uh, that. And then I brought up the, the happy birthday sign and I talked about how a string is like characters strung together and all this stuff. And it's not a perfect analogy, but the fact of the matter is, is it, it expressed the concept to them in a way that, I could, that they could best understand. And then I had a, an Amazon box that I used as a container and I talked about variables and then I put uh, a bunch of different Boba Fett's uh, f figurines out on the, the, the desk to show them kind of what an array is like. And I, I, I took these lessons back with me and I thought like, I should use this in, in my next course uh, because it's giving me an opportunity to, to sort of build metaphors and, 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 and work with information that people already have in order to um, build on concepts that are completely new to people. Okay. And that's the, probably the most feedback I've ever gotten was on my, uh, one of my fundamentals courses, talking about fundamentals of, of web development, which really got into the JavaScript programming language and where I use these same, same lessons because uh, adults respond to this type of, of learning and this type of explanation just as much as kids do. So being able to take information you already know and relate it to new concepts in something mm -hmm. that's, that's uh, you know, just easy to understand, that made all the difference in the world for me. Yeah, and I like the idea of keeping it simple. Uh, I think people try to overcomplicate things probably because they're trying to prove how smart they are, and yeah. they think that it'll have more value <laughs> if they sound smart. And, uh, right. And I'm not, that's okay. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, there's a lot of smart people out there. That I just. I just right. don't understand. But uh, I, I appreciate breaking things down to to my level, even if it's a little bit below my level. That's okay. I, I want to get. Right. I don't want. Uh, I don't want these barriers I have to climb over to understand right. the concept. So I appreciate and that. And and what's cool though too with like Chat GTP is that now you don't have to be like, hey, grade school, can I come in and present? You know. <laughs> You can go in and you can say, Here, here's the concept that I want to teach. Uh, a, a prompt that I like to use is, is I'll ask the model to adopt the mindset of a sixth grader okay. and tell it to only respond to me using um, the, the vernacular and the vocabulary of a sixth grader. Interesting. And I'll tell it, I'm going to present to you a lesson and I want you to ask me questions, you know, taking on this identity and help me explain to you, you know, whatever this thing is. And going through this process and, and creating this like interview type um, scenario with the model can help you achieve that same type of, of ability to break things down in a way. Because, you know, it's, we have the curse of knowledge, right? It's just like easy for us. We've been around it forever. Yes. Um, but when you're forced through an interaction with either another person or perhaps through an AI model to, to, to really take it down to, to something that's understandable, that can take you a, a long way as well. Yeah, I think you just made the point that I was trying to make earlier, which was that when people, I said, I, <laughs> I use a disparaging term, like they try to sound smart. Really what they're right. doing is they're, they're speaking to other people and they're assuming that they know uh, approximately yes. the same level of background as they know. And that's usually right. a bad assumption. We all have, I'm, right. you, there may be something that I know really, really well, but you're talking about something that I'm a complete novice at. And so right. even though you and I might both be smart, we're not smart at the same things. Exactly. And, and people forget that a lot. Teachers yes. forget that. And, and that's the whole thing about online learning, whether it comes to technical documentation or, or building a you know, web development course or some other type of course. The fact of the matter is, is just like you said, everybody is a beginner at something, even if you have a ridiculous amount of experience in, in other areas. And so it, it, it was interesting. Um, do you know Paul Sheriff? I do. Nice guy. Okay. So I, yeah, I used to work for, for his, his company. Um, when I was first getting started, taught me a ton. Super grateful for, for the, the opportunity to, to, to come under his wing. And I remember uh, he was preparing for some conferences and he, he told me, you know what? Just stick to the one on, 101 concepts. Like you, you, if you look at all of the, the conferences, you, you know, the sessions that are the 201s, the 301s or whatever, people are there. But really, the, the demand and the need is for the beginner content. Mm -hmm. And it's because you're always a beginner at something. Sure. Uh, plus, the industry has been expanding for decades now. Oh, my gosh. And there's yeah. so many people <laughs> entering it. Um, this last year excluded, of course. Right. <laughs> um, I noticed that now you're, you're, you've been creating courses. 
and teaching people about techno concepts, and now you're emphasizing uh, uh, teaching people about course content. You're teaching the teachers. Is that that's yeah. deliberate, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So you know, one of the things that I notice with um, with technology courses is that they tend to age. Of course, uh, you yeah. know, the, the, the shelf life <laughs> and probably more rapidly now than ever. And so I thought, OK, well, if I wanted to really dial in on something, um, it would make sense to go with concepts that are evergreen. Mm -hmm. And so taking, uh, again, my experience, things that I've had success in, um, I, I was sort of trying to figure out, well, how could I help apply that to a broader context and, and help even more people? And so that's why I decided to almost any business, almost any subject matter experts, m most entrepreneurs f have need and have reason to build information products and sell courses. Uh, so yeah, that just seemed like the perfect fit for me to be able to, to go in and help out. Awesome. Where can people find you online? I know that's a lot of places. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the easiest way is on Twitter. Uh, okay. That's where if, if you're interested in, in these subject matters, if uh, I'm just at Craig Shoemaker. Uh, my website is craigshoemaker.net. And then I also get a chance to, uh, to, to reverse the roles a little bit and uh, host a podcast. It's called Leverage 3. Um, the, the tagline is um, uh, talents, uh, I don't need my own tagline. Uh, <laughs> talents and tactics of high performers. And, and the idea is uh, I'll interview people and at the end of each show, I'll ask them to uh, share three actionable tactics that uh, people can take from the conversation and, and take with them on the day. All right, and I, I'm having it up right now. CraigShoemaker.net slash leverage three. Yes. Craig, so, thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun talking to you today. I appreciate it. It's been a blast. You can make technology and you can make friends, but no one can make a David Giard.